Natural Origins of Economics is a book written by Margaret Shabas and published in 2005. It's important for the history of economic thought because its aim is to trace the evolution of economics from the classical period, which broadly started with Adam Smith, all the way to the neoclassical period, which is the school of thought that we still find in contemporary economics today. Shabas makes two important points, which helps us to think around the ontological, epistemological, and philosophical foundations of neoclassical economic thought and the relationship that this has with its precursor in classical economics. And so really, her main two arguments are, firstly, that the transition from classical to neoclassical economics was a transition of denaturalization, and secondly, that the two schools of thought differ in what they view as the correct unit of economic analysis. I'll begin by discussing the first point of denaturalization. Now, Shabas offers a very interesting argument which demonstrates how classical economic thought was interwoven with many scientific breakthroughs in natural science and biology at the same time that many classical economists were writing. And so she demonstrates a relationship between economics and natural sciences. And as such, classical economists, economists are argued as seeing human decision-making as primarily influenced by our underlying passions and instincts. Now, this is not to say that rationality and consideration doesn't happen, but rather classical economists argue that this is just an edifice for our underlying passions and instincts, which are the true source of our decision-making. And of course, it's easy to see how this is a lineage of Aristotelian thought, which was focused on the desires and appetites of human beings. And so in a classical sense, at least, the role of economists was to uncover the natural laws which drove human economic behavior. And because of this focus on natural laws, Shabas argues that classical economists saw the economy as this natural phenomenon which was ordained by God and tended towards equilibrium and balances of its own right without much human intervention. As a result of this, the economy was almost beyond the reach of human beings. And it's important to understand the philosophical context of the time, which was very much rooted in Christian values and saw the agency of God above the agency of human beings. And so if the economy was something that was instituted by God and a product of the natural instincts of man, which were created by God, then naturally the economy itself was something which couldn't really be influenced by individual humans, but existed on its own and was governed by natural processes. So Shabas gives us a number of examples of classical economic theorists that adhered with this line of thinking. And of course, the most obvious first example is that of the physiocrats. We've discussed how Kene was traditionally trained as a doctor and how the ideas of natural flows within the human body were imported into the economy around this idea of natural flow within the economy itself. Also, physiocrats asserted that wealth was found in the natural bounty of the earth. And while human labor had something to do with wealth, the true source really was nature itself. And so human agency didn't have that much to do with the economy. So, so here we can begin to understand this philosophy of the economy almost being beyond the reach of humans, because you and I can't control the way that blood flows in our bodies, because that's a natural process that governs itself. And so similarly, the economists of the time thought that the economy worked and flowed in a similar way, and it was beyond our reach of control, because there were a set of natural laws which governed that, and individual humans didn't really have the ability to change those laws. 
We can also think of Adam Smith in a similar vein. Now, obviously, we all know that Smith gives us some groundbreaking insights into things like market processes, trade, and the division of labor. And obviously, any modern economist would describe these things in terms of rational individual behavior and utility maximization, but Smith didn't necessarily think of them in that way. In fact, he thought of all of these processes as embedded in much more fundamental and intrinsic human nature, which was bequeathed to us by God. In fact, he argues that humans are naturally created by God to undertake activities like bartering and trading with one another. And understanding Smith in this way also helps us to understand his policy suggestions. So we all know that Smith was very much against the ideas of mercantilism and monopolies which were instituted by the monarchy. And if we think about this idea of natural law, Adam Smith would argue that a monopoly was actually an unnatural perversion of the natural order of the economy. And so when we interfere with things by instituting monopolies, we actually go against the design which was instituted by God himself. And so Adam Smith's policies were really revolving around this idea of going back to what the natural state of the economy should look like. The last example that Shabbas gives us is David Hume, who she argues was influenced by ideas at the time around how electricity flowed. And so David Hume argued that monetary flows really were analogous in a sense to the flow of electricity and allocated themselves according to certain natural laws and had very little to do with individual agency. Now, obviously, this focus on natural phenomena is very much foreign to modern economic thinking. And so what changed between classical and neoclassical econ economics? Well, Shabas argues that the departure point really emerged around John Stuart Mill. Mill argued that human behavior is not inherently natural, but rather man is rational and he has agency over his decision making. So he can make real decisions to guide and change his life. And this really fundamentally shifted the way that we think about human beings as actors, rather than being intrinsically guided by their nature, were intrinsically guided by rationality. And so Mill suggested that economic behavior is, in fact, an inherently mental activity, and that the economy is not natural, but it's artificial. Now, what did he mean by this? Well, the economy only exists out of human behaviors and decisions. It's not similar to natural processes because really, in a sense, the economy only exists in our minds. And if the economy only exists as a product of all of our collective decisions and actions, then ultimately the economy can be changed by humans as well. So really, we can think about this change from classical to neoclassical economics as a shift from realism to nominalism. People like Adam Smith, Hume, and the physiocrats were really concerned about metaphysical questions about what does the natural order of society look like and how did God intend for the economy to work? Whereas from Mill onwards in the neoclassical school, rejected these metaphysical questions and said that economics doesn't really have much to say about them. But what we can focus on is this nominalist perspective of the individual, their rationality and their utility maximization. And so this ontological position was adopted by neoclassical economists from then onwards, who go on, as we all know, to promulgate a massive series of quantitative and statistical calculations which try and allow us to compute the vast array of individual rational behavior. Now I'm going to pause for a moment and just think back to the questions that are posed to us by Mittermeier. Classical economists who were concerned with natural laws didn't shy away from giving us prescriptions of what ought to be and what ought to be in their mind is that which is natural. And so economic policy ultimately should strive to minimize things which are unnatural, like in Adam Smith's case, monopolies. 
Whereas neoclassical economists say that the only thing really that exists is the things that rational individuals do. And so we can't really talk about what ought to be because all there is is that which exists. But interestingly, Shabazz suggests that neoclassical economists have become the great social engineers of our time who try and use mathematics and models to shape the direction of entire countries and economies. So clearly neoclassical economists still make policy prescriptions. And this suggests that maybe they aren't truly denaturalized. For example, if we think about maximizing welfare, well, economists can give us a whole lot of quantitative information about what we should do in order to maximize welfare. But before we can reach that conclusion, we need to make a subjective judgment about what social welfare really is. So we can draw a question mark around the extent to which neoclassical economics is truly denaturalized. And then very briefly, onto Shabas's second line of argument, that revolves around the unit of economic analysis. So Shabas argues that classical economists were mainly concerned with analyzing the group. As we've seen in physiocratic thought and even in Adam Smith, there was a, a concern with grouping society into various classes, such as landlords, workers, and capitalists. And economists concerned themselves with understanding the natural laws that govern the type of behavior within each of these groups. Now, these groups were considered important because individuals within those groups would aim to cooperate with one another to achieve the self-interest of that specific group although that self-interest didn't necessarily serve the whole of society. So Adam Smith gives us this very famous example where he says, whenever all of the members in a certain class of society meet up with one another, the conversation will naturally turn to how they can maximize their profits and thereby steal from the rest of society. And this is considered a behavior which is governed by the natural law of that specific group. Now, neoclassical economists obviously place the emphasis on the individual. And so they would say to us that groups in society which act according to natural laws, these broad homogenizations, actually don't exist in the first place. But all that we can really think about is individuals who are guided by rational behavior and attempt to maximize their utility. So, for example, while workers may behave similarly to one another in the economy, we can't really say anything about a natural law which governs the behavior of workers. All that we can think about is an individual worker who's concerned with maximizing their own self-interest. And from there, we can talk about the types of behaviors that they would take to do that. And by chance, it may happen that other workers around them behave in a similar way but that doesn't necessarily suggest natural laws which govern all workers. So coming to the end of my discussion of the natural origins of economics, there's a few questions that I'd like to leave you with to think about. The first one is, at least in Shabas's sense, can we say that neoclassical economics is truly denaturalized, or is it in fact still concerned with broad laws of nature that govern human behavior? The second thing is, Classical economists unashamedly asserted certain policy positions. Does neoclassical economics still do the same thing? And if so, does it claim to do that or does it only claim to depict reality? The third thing is, are there really natural laws which govern human behavior, like sympathy or morality? Certainly, if we think about the way that we speak about ourselves in everyday life, that would suggest that is the case. But if we think about it from an economic sense, do these natural laws exist? The second last question is, can we really reduce everything to the individual, to rationality and to utility? Or is there something deeper than that in human behavior? And the last question that I'd like to leave you with is, what is the correct unit of economic analysis? Should we be looking at the individual? as neoclassical economists suggest, or should we be looking at the group as classical economists suggest? Thank you.